morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this uh, first Sunday after Epiphany. Uh, you've probably met them in the last months, the Sorsen family, uh, Mike and Melissa and, and their son Carter. And uh, today they're going to be received into membership. In the course of going through the, the classes that we have been doing for some weeks now, uh, Mike realized that they were going to been baptized and so this morning we're going to correct that he's going to be baptized at the first part of our service and carter also has not been so uh carter two baptisms this morning will take them into membership but it's also a, a special day in the church here because the first sunday after epiphany is when we celebrate the baptism of jesus where he is called into service um, ordained as, as you will uh, and undertakes the ministry that he um, came into the world to fulfill, to serve as our substitute, uh, the vicarious atonement. So he redeems us from all sin. But that all begins um, officially with the baptism uh, that uh, we'll hear about in the gospel lesson this morning. So God bless your worship this morning. We have a baptismal hymn to open our service this morning. <coughs> worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Savior Jesus Christ commanded baptism when he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God and are condemned to eternal death. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He took away our sin by giving his life on the cross. In baptism, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness and gives us a new life. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives. 
Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be crowned by daily sorrow and repentance, and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his sins and suffering in death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me. God saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit and united us to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Every day, God forgives your sins, removes your guilt, and strengthens you to defeat Satan's power. His promises for you and your children. He will never forsake you. Your sins are forgiven. You are clothed with Christ. You are at peace with God now and forever. Amen. We ask uh, Mike and Carter and uh, family to come forward. Michael Scott Source and I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Receive the sign of the cross both on the head and on the heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ to crucify. Carter Dean Herrick, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Receive the sign of the cross both on the head and the heart, to mark you as one who has been redeemed by the, the crucified one, Jesus Christ. And I should say now that Carter, being brought here this morning by his parents, will understand that when God commands that we are to go to all nations, baptizing and teaching them, that includes children. The Almighty God and and uh, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has given you both new birth of water and the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit, and has forgiven all your sins. May he strengthen you with his grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. Mike and Melissa, you have come after months of study with us to believe that the teachings of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and of this congregation, Zion, are faithful to the word of God. You desire to become members of this congregation so that you may enjoy the blessings of the means of grace and the fellowship of believers? If so, answer, yes, I do. Yes. With, with sincere joy, we welcome you as members of Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church, Mike and Melissa. That includes you too, Carter. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, as we welcome the sources to our Christian family, I encourage you in the name of Jesus to keep them in your minds, hold them in your hearts, and pray for them again and again. Show them the face of friendship, and offer them a hand of support. Encourage them with your works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature 
attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The peace of Christ be then with us all. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, uh, <clears throat> at that time you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. He, Mike, and Carter, and all of us who are baptized into Christ, faithful in our calling as your children, and make us heirs with him of everlasting life, through your son Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We turn now to our first reading, our first reading where the Lord promises to put the Spirit on the Messiah, empowering the Anointed One to free us from our sins. We see this promise fulfilled when Jesus is baptized, from Isaiah chapter 42. The prophet writes, Here is my servant to my uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight, I'm placing my Spirit on him. He will announce a just verdict for the nations. He will not cry out. He will not raise his voice. He will not make his voice heard in the street. A bent reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not snuff out. He will faithfully bring forth a just verdict. He will not burn out, and he will not be broken until he establishes justice on the earth. The coastlands will wait for his law, this is what the, the true God says. The Lord who sustain, who creates the heavens and stretches them out, who spreads out the earth and everything that it produces, who gives breath to the people on it and life to those who walk on it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will hold on to your hand and I will guard you. I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people, to be a light for the nations to open the eyes of the blind, to bring the prisoners out from the dungeon, and to bring those who sit in darkness out of prison. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our song this morning, Psalm from Psalm 45, Great are the works of the Lord.
Peter told others how God had anointed Jesus. Through that good news, the Holy Spirit was poured out on Peter's listeners. We read from Acts chapter 10 at verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. Now I really am beginning to understand that God does not show favoritism, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent his word to the people of Israel, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us rise for the gospel lesson. <laughs> waters of the Jordan, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power from Matthew chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to be baptized by John at the, at the Jordan. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, because it is proper for us, <clears throat> for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John let him. After Jesus was baptized, he immediately went up out of the water. Suddenly the heavens were opened for him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and landing on him. The voice out of the heavens said, This is my Son, whom I love. I am well pleased with him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We'll continue as we sing our next hymn to Jordan's River, Tame Our Lord. Thank mm -hmm. you.
fellow believers, grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the movie The Jazz Singer, a young Jewish man leads a double life. He would dress up in blackface and go across town and join a group of black jazz singers in a club there because he loved and was moved by that kind of music. When the gig was finished, he would race back to his Jewish neighborhood in time to teach his grade school Hebrew class. You ever know what the feeling is like to go somewhere where you aren't really supposed to be or you've been told isn't the right place for you to be? What an uncomfortable uh, sensation it can be to do that for the first time. You wonder what, uh, it's, it's a compelling story because I think we all know how that feels at some point in our lives. Peter, the apostle, had been joyfully and faithfully preaching about Jesus among his own people for a few years now. His own people. That means he was preaching to the Jews. He was going into synagogues and preaching about Jesus Christ. And a series of events had led him to travel up to northern Palestine to Caesarea. And when he had a vision on top of a housetop, things changed. The vision was of a large sheet that was let down from heaven. And in the sheet there was a variety of animals that were not uh, ceremonially clean for the Jews. In other words, they were animals that Jews weren't supposed to to eat. And in the vision, Peter heard a voice, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, certainly not, Lord, <clears throat> for I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And it was at that moment that messengers arrived from Caesarea, and they were uh, sent to bring Peter to visit Cornelius. <clears throat> Cornelius was a Roman centurion. He had become a worshiper of the Lord, of a Savior who wasn't limited to just some of Adam and Eve's children. It was meant for all of Adam's family. And later on, when the Lord chose Abram and announced his plans to bring forth the Savior from his family, from his line, it was a Savior who would be a blessing, and God was very careful how he said it, a blessing for all nations. God saw that and said that clearly from the beginning. He didn't show favoritism in the generations that followed. He dealt with the Israelites. He dealt with their continual disobedience, right? He showed his faithfulness to his word and his promise. No matter how bad it got between he and the Israelites, he never disowned them. It all led up to the fullness of time. And, and eventually the birth of Jesus. Jesus was born, he lived Jewish. But he carried in his heart the realization about his work, that it would bring salvation beyond the borders of Israel or the nation of the Jews. And then during the last week of Jesus' life on this earth, at the Passover festival, some Greeks were there to worship the Lord, to worship Jesus. And they wanted to, to see him, and when the request came to Jesus, he saw something tragic, and yet he saw something marvelous. Now, think about this statement that Jesus makes in relation to what he knows he's about to suffer. Amen, amen, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it continues to be one kernel. But if it dies, it produces much grain. You see, Jesus saw the day coming when his death and his burial and his resurrection would be proclaimed to God's glory among all the nations, all, all over the world. And there would be a gathering in of many souls. And now Peter... Now Peter is in Cornelius' home, 
a Roman soldier, a person with a, a history and perspectives <clears throat> that are far different from Peter's, right? Uh, and, and Peter told Cornelius, now I really am beginning to understand that God does not show favoritism, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Being a Roman soldier meant he was not to be afraid of anything. But Peter says saving faith means a believer will have a fear of God in the sense, of, well, not in the sense of, of terror, uh, because God punishes sin, but rather an awe-filled respect of God, um, a holy regard for God that is underwritten by a by an undying love, a genuine love and devotion. Saving faith also produces in a person the desire to, to do the right thing. Um, a believer, a child of God, wants to do the right thing, wants to serve God, not with the thought that by doing this I'm going to win God's approval and uh, I'll be a, a shoe in when it's time to go to heaven. No. But every day, a believer wants to do the right thing as we turn away from our sins in repentance, in, in uh, saying you're sorry and resolving not to do those things again, and willingly doing the will of God in faith. The other thing Peter pointed out to Cornelius was that in every nation, Jesus heals those who are oppressed by the devil. Peter goes on in our text. He sent his word to the people of Israel, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. And now he says to Cornelius, do you know what happened? But throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. The things Jesus had done, he had done them in Israel. And there was a reason for that. It wasn't done in a vacuum. His deeds had been told and retold by lots of people that saw him. He was very popular. And Gentiles like Cornelius, who believed in the God of Israel and waited along with the Jews uh, for redemption, were surely hearing these stories. Uh, things that had happened and in some part they were affected by them too a man like Cornelius but hearing a rumor about what might or might not have been done by a Jewish rabbi is a lot different than having somebody show up in your living room as an eyewitness of the risen Christ as Peter now was Cornelius represented Surely in front of Peter, that he represented the whole Gentile world, lost in sin and ignorant of God. Paul wrote in uh, Romans chapter 2, For God does not show favoritism. Indeed, all people who have sinned without law will also perish without law, and all the people who have sinned in connection with law will be judged by law. Paul is saying that with God, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Everyone gets judged on the same merits. The Jews to whom God has given the, the promise, given them a homeland, uh, given uh, them deliverance from slavery, and sent them prophets, they had every reason to be completely faithful to God and obedient to him, but most often they were not. They were faithless and they were disobedient. The Gentiles, on the other hand, they oftentimes had virtually no direct word of God about his holy law. They had the natural knowledge of God. They knew a basic knowledge of right and wrong. Incomplete as it was, they had a conscience uh, which made them accountable to God's law. But in both cases, God would have to judge, condemn, and punish both Jew and Gentile alike. Or their disobedience. 
But Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. Last line of our text. That's what he did after he was baptized in the Jordan. He did it in Israel to prove to the Israels that what did God do? He kept his word. God kept his word. He kept his promise. He came to their aid. And what happened? Jesus was put to death by who? Unbelieving Jews. Which brought about God's real solution, total and complete solution for sin. Redemption through atonement. <clears throat> Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, that's what John called him when he, when he approached. One forgiveness for all people oppressed by the devil. So who are all those who are oppressed by the devil? And your, your mind probably right away goes to, oh well, there are lots of examples in the New Testament of the demon-possessed people that were walking around in the time of Jesus. There were some famous examples, the gatherings where the pigs rushed down the hill into the water and so forth. It's so much more than that, though. Because you can answer this question, who isn't oppressed by the devil? Right? Who among us isn't oppressed by the devil? Jesus released suffering people from disease and from sinful control and from guilt and from hatred and from all the things that the devil tries to do to us to keep us away from grace and to keep us stuck in sin. If Jesus had only appeared as a miracle worker, he would have been little used to Cornelius or any of us today. But Jesus' miracles, powerful as they were, really only pointed to his greater work. Because by atoning for sin, Jesus broke the devil's power over the sinner completely. The power he exercises through guilt and fear that doesn't work anymore. Once you know the secret, he's been defeated. It is the unforgiven sinner of any land or any language who dreads and trembles under God's judgment. No religious uh, service or, or drug or, or chemical or, or any kind of a treatment or pill can take away the dread and the emptiness that comes with unbelief. But where Jesus is preached, people find God. And they're reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus. They find in God the one whose word is true, whose word is dependable, who has kept his promise of salvation. They find the Lord of all, who is the joy of all, who come to him through faith in Jesus. In every nation, Jesus heals those who are oppressed by the devil. What do we do with that? Well, first we thank God that he um, called us and our ancestors perhaps to be those who knew the Lord. Thank the Lord that we are not out in the woods somewhere worshiping a tree or some golden object. Thank the Lord that he's opened a way for us to come to him with a guilt-free conscience. And thank the Lord that in Jesus, he's revealed to us a God who is with us and not against us. I thought this was a great story <clears throat> that I'm about to share with you. And I went online and I found out it may not be true. <laughs> I'm still going to share it. <laughs> Um, because, well, you, you take it with a grain of salt. But I think it makes a good point. There was a poor Scottish farmer named Fleming who did a simple act of kindness. He heard a cry for help from a bog near where he was working. He dropped his tools, ran, and found a terrified boy waist deep in black mud. He was screaming and struggling desperately to free himself. Fleming saved the boy from what could have been a slow and, and agonizing death. The next day, an elegant carriage pulled up to the Scotsman's humble house. The nobleman who had stepped out introduced himself as the father 
of the boy swimming him safe. He said, I want to repay you. You saved my son's life. And the, the farmer, farmer swimming, said, no, I can't take any money for that. And at that moment, the farmer's son came around the corner and the nobleman offered, if you won't take any money, please allow me to pay for your son's education. And that he did. Later on, that son became known as Sir Alexander Fleming, who was the discoverer of penicillin. And some years later, the nobleman's son was stricken with pneumonia and was saved by penicillin. And that nobleman's son, first saved from the fog and later saved from penicillin, was none other than Winston Churchill, Sir Winston Churchill. Now, the principles are no longer living. It's hard to prove whether this did or didn't happen, but, but here's the gist of it. And it may be as true in your own life as well, that God has put you sometimes exactly where he wanted you to be. Exactly where you could never have imagined yourself to be. To be able to share the gospel with someone. I, I know of a situation right now in our congregation where someone gets to hear the gospel who might otherwise never have heard it. And isn't that always the case with the people that God puts in front of us and lets us share the news about his son with uh, these people? God is infinitely greater than we are and, and works things uh, far ahead uh, of us that we could possibly figure out. Our whole lives, in fact, pieced together very carefully following a, pl a plan, a divine plan that he has for you and for me to be with him in heaven. And, and the God's stated purpose is that plan is for every human being. Now, lots of people reject that plan. But many don't. We have not, by the grace of God, done so. God sends you out unique people that you are, newly baptized as you are. And who knows what effect your life is going to have on the people that God puts you in front of. But go then to the places in this world where, I don't know, maybe they're outside of your social circle. Maybe they're not as comfortable for you as uh, or as places you would ordinarily go. Let us reach out to those with whom we maybe have uh, little in common with, but what we'll find out, in fact, is that we do have some very basic things in common. The most important things, we all have an immortal soul, and we all were born in sin in this world. And we all have a deep need to hear the gospel again and again and again. There's a whole world out there laboring under the curse of sin. A whole world redeemed by Jesus and needing to hear the gospel of forgiveness. And the Lord's made us his crew to go and preach the good news. God bless you as you go. Amen. Let us rise. <clears throat> May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Both continue as we confess our Christian faith with the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. 
He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. In our prayers this morning, we included another prayer for the Sorsen family, and we we'll also uh, include a prayer for uh, Reed Robert uh, Block, who was born yesterday afternoon, around 3 in the afternoon, I understand. Uh, the family is doing well, and we include them in our prayers this morning. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have re revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. And as your word in our hearts, and cause it to produce good in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth in the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise our Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Gracious Father, we thank you for leading the source and family to desire to become members of our congregation and for giving them joy to confess their faith to us. Guide us with your wisdom as we worship and work together. Mold our minds and hearts in a single Christ-like will so that we may be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. We praise you, O Lord, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Receive our thanks that you have uh, brought read and Ashley safely through delivery. In your goodness, you have filled the hearts of this family with joy. Bless this child by caring for all his needs and watching over him with your protecting hand. As you gave your son to purchase this child for yourself, so also send your spirit through baptism that he may become a member of your family of faith. May his parents and this congregation Lead him to your saving love all his days, that you may preserve him with life that never ends. Comfort this morning all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity, especially Pam Sorsen, the mother of Mike Sorsen, who has received a difficult health diagnosis this past week. Remember also those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or love are living with sadness. Give us the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. 
Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus who died and rose again. Amen. This time we ask our ushers to come forward as we gather our gifts for the Lord's work. Congregation, please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks in grace. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who lived among us as a human being and revealed his glory as your only Son, full of grace and truth. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. sending your son Jesus Christ and we remember the great acts of love through which he has transformed us from sin, death and the devil's power by his incarnation he became one with us by his perfect life he fulfilled your holy will by his innocent death he overcame hell by his rising from the grave he opened heaven invited by your grace and instructed by your word we approach your table <coughs> with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood, and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, 
He gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the full and free forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the full, the free forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. Take and drink the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you on the cross for the full and free forgiveness of all of your sins. Rest. 
take and drink. <clears throat> this is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you on the cross for the full, the free forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. <clears throat> May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. You are truly forgiven of your sins. Depart now, live in peace with your Lord and in each other. is the true blood of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you on the cross for the full, the free forgiveness of all of your sins. Thank you. In this true body and blood of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in the one True faith unto life everlasting. You are truly forgiven of your sins. Depart now and live in peace with your Lord and with each other.
let us rise. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread or drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll remain standing as we sing our final hymn <coughs>
Please be seated. Just a few announcements this uh, evening at 6 p.m. We have our ladies' aid meeting, and uh, we hope that the ladies of the congregation will be able to join us. If you've never come, come. You're invited, uh, ladies. And then uh, there is a, a cake to celebrate our new members in the social hall, and we'll uh, share some of that after the service, uh, cake and coffee. And uh, your meditations devotions that start not until the end of February are out. There's some in the back here, there's some in the entryway in the, um, in the rack. And just one little announcement. Um, uh, the Spencer and Ashley have asked that uh, the visitors that would like to come and see the new baby, as I'm sure many would, would wait until they get home and not go to the hospital for various reasons. But um, so, and I think that's going to be fairly soon. I, I wouldn't want to guess when. And you have another announcement? No, I just believe uh, you said Spencer. I'm not sure who Spencer is. George. 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 Yeah. No, I've done that before, haven't I? <laughs> His name is Stuart. He's a, a lifelong member of this congregation. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Do you need to announce about the quarterly meeting? Well, I don't think we said it officially, but is it next Sunday? Okay, we are close. Or will it be next Sunday? <laughs> there is a, we do have to uh, announce it twice before it happens. 31st. Okay, so it'll be in, in two weeks. Two weeks from today, right? Two weeks from today. Yes. Okay, a quarterly meeting. Very good. God bless you.